This is People I Know Show, a podcast about interesting people, personal growth, and being wrong. I'm Kurt Karstensen. This is episode 31 of the podcast. My guest today is Corey Hollenhorst. Corey is someone I hadn't seen in a very long time. My pursuit of this podcast allows me a great reason to bring back into my life people that might not have otherwise re-entered. Later in the episode, in the personal growth and being wrong segments, Corey and I talk about obsessions, guitars, and why Corey was wrong to remove people from his life. As the title of this episode indicates, Corey spends some time helping us all alleviate some of the misconceptions about Down syndrome. But first, when you don't see someone in a very long time, it is good to catch up. Here's my conversation with Corey Hollenhorst. As has happened on a few previous episodes of People I Know Show, I am joined today by someone I know I haven't seen in at least 10 years prior to the few minutes that we just met up a few minutes ago. Corey Hollenhorst joins me. Corey, do you have any recollection of us seeing each other since 2003? The last time I know we would have definitely seen each other. Um, I don't know if we even would have seen each other in 2003. So, 2002, that's Yeah, right. 2002. I think, but I did come back. I came back to Alexandria for some reason at some point years after, uh, after playing there. And then I ended up sitting in the booth and I want to say I sat in with you and did an inning or two on the radio, but I don't remember exactly, exactly I, what that might've been. And I don't have any idea what year that would have been either. I know that you had spent some time on broadcast with me as of course I was the broadcaster for the Alexandria Beatles. You played for that baseball team for two seasons, a second of which I was there. So right. 2001, 2002. Right. So we're going way back here and and even if we think we're we're correct in the things that were we're coming to mind with, they probably <laughs> and for that many years, who knows how yeah. how strong our memories are anyhow. Yeah. If it, if I had to put a number on it, it'd probably be fourteen, fifteen years ago though. I mean I can't I can't even remember what reason I came back to that uh for that game, but it was there was some reason, be, but it was after my time playing there and after and my time being in college. They did have the Beatles, the Northwoods League team that was based in Alexandria for about a decade or so. It, it no longer exists. They did have some alumni games. And since you are more local, I'm sure they got an invitation. I don't know if you showed up to the like yeah, alumni sure. come and watch the game as a part of an outing. Yeah, I think that was what it was. I think they had some of us back and I live. I mean, I still I. When I came back from college, I ended up back home in St. Cloud where I was born and raised, and I'm sure I came up for some reason. And I still keep in touch with my host families up there a little bit too, so I might have had just occasion to come visit them. And for those listeners that have listened to most or every episode, you might remember episode 22 was with Matt Jones, who was the manager of the team one of the years that you were there, and that is the reason that we most specifically got back in touch. You listened to that. Yeah. made some sort of comment and I, I got the idea in my head that at some point I'd better have you on because I think there's some interesting things that will come out of our conversation today. But before we get into some of that, what what have you been doing with the last 15 years of your life? Well, in my senior year of college, I got engaged to my longtime, my high school sweetheart at the time she would have been. And she also went to Iowa, um, University of Iowa and Iowa City. And so we were engaged. And we came back to uh, central Minnesota after I finished college. She was a year younger than me. We came back with intents to getting married in our hometown and then moving away far away lands and exploring the world or what, you know, who knows where we would have ended up, but certainly had no intention of sticking around. But we came back and had a few months to kill before our wedding. I was, uh, and I was just kind of hanging out at my parents' house and golfing a lot and just kind of laying low. And then she ended up getting a good job and decided we wanted to try to stick around St. Cloud. And so I said, okay, I guess I'll take a look and um, found my way to a job in an industry that um, I was interested in, the world of advertising. And uh, then really spent the next decade or so kind of immersed in that world. And we ended up staying in St. Cloud and, and um, I worked in the digital advertising realm. So websites and apps and that kind of stuff. And primarily as a web developer and account person for that, that kind of stuff and did that for most of my, most of that time. And then we decided to have a family and that, that basically, once you decide to make that move, if you're, if you're already from a place, you have all the built-in babysitting and, you know, Definitely. help 
that uh, you could ever dream of. So um, that pretty much rooted us, I would say, fairly permanently in central Minnesota. Um, and I've, you know, have four kids now. Um, our youngest will be two this summer and our oldest just turned eight. Uh, we got a couple in between there. So four kids. Um, five years ago this week, I switched industries altogether and went in to uh, uh, the building materials industry where I work for a company that makes hardwood products. Uh, and I, I run sales and marketing for that company. And um, that takes me all over the country and all over North America and um, totally different than what I was doing. And in many ways, an exciting, different adventure and kind of got out of the website game about the right time. It was about the time when you could, when the Wix.coms and Squarespaces and all those things came about where you could make a website for virtually nothing on your own. And someone with a lot of experience and expertise like I had in the companies I'd been working for, I'd kind of been uh, a little bit pushed out or had to reshape. And it was just about the, just about the time that I left. So it was, it was all kind of kismet, I think. Was it a, a smooth transition where things came together or were you debating other other jobs, applying for a bunch of stuff. Like I, I haven't really dealt with that a whole lot in my own life. I know a lot of people make hard shifts. Like I, I made I probably like a, a soft shift in my career. I just kind of fell into what I'm doing now with a lot, not a lot of forethought. How, how did it go for you? Um, to be honest, I think it was a little bit of I was getting ants in my pants. I wanted to do something different. I wasn't sure what that was. I had, I had pretty much invested all of my 20s and in my early 30s in being really good at what I was doing. And as <clears throat> as that industry started to shift, so did my desires to be in it. I just sort of lost my love for it. I wasn't real excited or passionate about it anymore. And um, I was taking a bad attitude from the day's work home with me. And my wife is kind of going, you probably need to just think about doing something different. Um, but I had, didn't know what that would be. So at one point I had worked for one company for many, many years, kind of from their start and it was great. And, uh, and I loved it and I still really like all those guys and, and, and it was a, it was a great place to work, but I thought maybe if I switched to a different company, it would just kind of re-energize me. So I left and joined a kind of another startup and it went pretty well for a while. But I think what I realized is I just wasn't interested in that work anymore, um, as luck would have it, a former client of mine was in the market for someone to run sales and marketing, um, and this company that I'm at now. And um, I had, I have a love for guitars. And when when this company was my client, uh, I made I made nice with with the boss there, and we'd like to talk guitars. So we kind of had always stayed in touch um, about silly stuff about guitars mainly. And, you know, one way or another, we, we got in contact, uh, around the time that I was sort of looking for something different. And it just so happened that he had a great opportunity that he thought I might be a good fit for. Um, and so we got together and it worked out. And like I said, I just celebrated five years there and, um, it's a complete shift as far as what I'm doing. I mean, I bring over my marketing skills and some of my creative abilities and I've employed those things at this job, but largely it's to run a sales force selling the products that we sell on a national level it's total, and in a building materials industry and architectural industry. So, um, completely different world. And it seems like people are always building new things. And in some points in uh, when the economy is good, just so much construction everywhere. So I'd imagine that it's very busy and at different points in the last five years, you've had a really busy stretch of time. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's real up and down. So the economy not being great and really hasn't quite recovered, you know, from 10 years ago when it took the huge dive, uh, it's making baby steps upward. There's been, it's the challenge has really been trying to find where to fit in and what the, what, uh, you know, where the company could move to uh, find opportunities. The, the traditional marketplace for what we sell kind of disappeared. And there's been a lot of consolidation. There's been a lot of uh, companies that just didn't survive. So, you know, we've, we've had to find ways to be, um, you know, maybe creative and, and find some new opportunities. And one of the things that's been uh, largely on my plate for the last, you know, three or four years specifically uh, was building our commercial division, sort of an emerging category for us, uh, which is architect driven. And it, that's the stuff that, um, you know, very traditionally what we make goes into residence, residences, um, but the stuff that we're doing, the commercial side is going into high rise condominiums and, um, you know, large hotels and things like that all over the world. And 
that's been that's been a different avenue for this company and it's been something that's been exciting and emerging and it's kind of helped lift what maybe was depleting uh, on the residential side so it's just been exciting you never know what tomorrow is going to bring and that's 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 a challenge and also sort of a good uh, a, a, a good challenge it's something that you can get up every day and have some excitement and go to you know try to figure out what you're gonna navigate toward that day how many nights per month would you say are you away from your family then to do this job um, it depends, and I have a lot of flexibility in that. So I, I and I've I've got because we stayed home, you know, so to speak, stayed in our hometown, and we have our family close by. We've had always had help, so it hasn't really been as huge a challenge as it probably would be for lots of other types of of people who don't have as many family and friends to help out. But I would, I mean, I'm probably on the road, gone a couple, maybe a couple weeks a month, and and probably not the whole week. I, and I'm not afraid to you know, take the last flight out and take a red eye home so I can wake up with the kids in the morning or, you know, find a way to get home to help put them to bed at night. So, um, we make it work and it's not too bad. And if, if it were more overwhelming, I would just be able to dial it back. It's kind of on my, you know, discretion as to when I need to be with the exception of a few meetings or a few events here and there, I pretty much can book stuff when it works for our life. And as we talked about, we haven't seen each other in a very long time, but with the power of social media and Facebook, occasionally I would see something that's going on in your life. And the thing that's definitely stood out, the thing that you've been most active and vocal about from like what I can tell is I don't even know which of your four children, like how far along the line this happened, but you had a child born with Down syndrome. And since then, I, I think you've been very vocal and active about trying to educate people about what that is like. Yeah. So my, that's my second child. My one son, his name is Parker. He just turned five in February. And um, I think, you know, growing up in the generation that we grew up in and understanding um, differences in people, it wasn't something we learned a lot about as kids. We didn't have a lot of exposure to it. We didn't have much education or information about it. So when we found out that um, he was, we found out prenatally with this new, some new technology. Uh, referred to as NIPS, N-I-P-S, non-invasive prenatal screening, um, basically allows you to do genetic testing on the, the baby while it's still in the womb. We found out that he'd have Down syndrome. We didn't know what that meant. And um, the resources as far as what the hospital and the clinic had for us weren't very good. And I thought that was really disappointing. Um, they didn't have a real good sense of how to prepare us all they really did was tell us how sad we, how, you know, how sad it was or how, you know, how sad they were for us or whatever. And I thought that was kind of a bad attitude to take. I thought that was kind of the wrong attitude to take. The approach should have been, you know, congratulations, this is exciting. Here's what we can do to get you prepared so you know what you might be looking forward to. Um, you know, certainly different than you were expecting, but it's not worse. It's just different. So with all that in mind, when we had him, you know, it was a life-changing event in a lot of ways. But more than anything, it just opened up my eyes to a lot of things I was missing in the world and um, just some attitude things that I could improve. But I also saw my mission a little bit being how can we help people who are in our same position get the right information that they need and take a little more proactive, positive approach to what it might mean to have a child with Down syndrome. Because it's made out to be this sad, scary thing and it's farthest, it couldn't be further from that. Um, and, you know, I was lucky that we did have, you know, someone in our community that we knew very little at the time. Um, but they had a child with Down syndrome who at the time was a teenager in high school. And um, the day we found out, it's the first person I called and I said, hey, I haven't seen you in years. But we just found out we're going to have a kid with Down syndrome. And the first words out of his mouth were, congratulations, you're going to love it. And it just energized me from that point forward. And I'm like, there's such a power to that positivity and that good outlook um, for anything. But certainly for that type of news, because what we had been getting from the professionals in our experience was very negative, or if not negative, it was very kind of overly sympathetic and it didn't need to be, it, it could still be as positive as any, as any birth. And, and that's the approach we took from day one. And in the years since, and and certainly in the time shortly after having him, I I made a an extra effort to anytime I'd post stuff, I would always try to put a little nugget of information that could help people be educated. Um, a lot of thing, a lot of silly things that people don't understand. I mean, people think that people with Down syndrome talk funny because they're too stupid to talk good or talk well or mm -hmm. talk clearly. 
um, it's not true at all. It's it's they have a physical disability that's a fairly big part of what Down syndrome is that makes it a real challenge for them to dictate clearly. Um, same thing with just walking and running and physical activity. So there's a whole component that no one ever talks about. We just lump them in this category of mentally challenged or you know disabled in one way or another, and don't really ever take the time to explain that difference. And so I've without being overly, you know, crusader, which I see some parents kind of get lost in that whole idea of being an advocate and kind of forget that your kid's right there. You know, you should, you can take all that time and just love and parent your kid and still make some time to help educate and advocate. Um, I haven't tried to get lost in the advocating side. I've just always found that there's an opportunity to share that information and to be one way or another helpful to somebody around to understand that difference. It just makes, it just makes a better uh, experience for us because then those people understand things better when we get to be around them and they're excited too. And frankly, the, the love and outpouring you have when you have a kid is great. The love and outpouring you have from friends and family when you have a kid with special needs is usually greater. And we've certainly experienced that. Um, and just being able to impart some knowledge about the condition has been, a positive thing because we've we've found our way to meet several other people in our life um, who through our various networks have had family or friends or whomever uh, that themselves had a child with Down syndrome and then we were able to become friends with them or you know give them a little push in the right direction or just share some war stories and, and details of our life together and you know it's it's been a really great thing it's been one of the most positive things in my life and I'm I'm couldn't be happier about it. And you had said that Parker was your second born of four kids. So you've had, obviously, every child's a different experience. How would you describe, you know, I think, I, I'm not, I do not have kids, but like the first kid, that's, that's a whole change in lifestyle. Right. And you add a second kid regardless, it's going to do something. And then you decide still to have more children. How did that all come together and play together in your mind for you and your wife? Well, a couple of things. I, I I came from a family. I'm one of three boys. I'm the middle. And my wife has just one brother. But we both came from pretty large extended families, lots of cousins and things like that. And as the generations have gone on, it's become more and more normal to have less kids. Um, but that hinders some of that experience that we had of big families growing up, you know, going to the lake with all your cousins or Christmases and, you know, Mother's Day and all these things where you're spending a lot of time with lots of other kids. In our case, I have an older brother with two older kids and my younger brother had just, I think he had just gotten married uh, a couple of weeks before we had Parker and they have, they don't have any kids yet. Um, and my, my wife's brother is, uh, is a little bit younger and doesn't, he's not in, in going to be having kids anytime soon, doesn't look like. So part of having more kids was just, we wanted to have more kids for our kids to play with, yeah. you know, just literally to have more kids around. Um, and that was, that was certainly part of it. Another part is, is, you know, just thinking kind of long term, um, you know, I expect great things out of Parker growing up and I think he's going to do really well. And, and this is a great time to be alive uh, with with conditions like Down syndrome. There's a lot of resources and a lot of help, but inevitably he's going to reach an age where he's going to need some help beyond what we may be able to do for him as we age. And um, luckily, I've been able to build some network of people who have had um, adults with Down syndrome and sort of kind of get a sense of what what role and responsibility the the siblings take and certainly more siblings is more helpful. And so that was part of it too, is just looking at 50 years from now, who's going to be there to help take care of Parker if we're not, um, if he needs it and maybe he won't and hopefully he doesn't, but you know, one way or another, whether he did or didn't have it, I still think we would have wanted a lot of kids. I think we would have expected that uh, the kids will be there for each other years down the road, whatever their needs may be. And, um, you know, to your first question, is it one, one kid's a life change. You, you, you really completely have to, and not in a bad way at all. I think it gets positioned as a bad thing too often. You have to be ready for it. You have to be willing to, uh, take, take a step back and be selfless for the first, really for the first time in your life, you have something that's solely respond, you know, you're responsible for, um, that, that changes you a lot. The more kids you add, the easier it becomes. They the the work doesn't multiply by the number of kids by any means, and they start you know if you space them out like we did, the older ones take care of the littler ones, and and, and it kind of works itself out. So, um, I, I always joke and I have to laugh because 
we go out in public, we have four kids and they're pretty well behaved for the most part. They can all be devils and terrorists when they want to be. <laughs> but we go out in public and we get these looks because it's not it's not the typical thing anymore to have a lot of kids. And we get kind of funny looks and people be like, oh, you guys got your hands full. And I, I have to laugh because every generation above us came from lots of kids in a family. I mean, it was totally normal to have five or seven or eight kids in a family. And my, both my parents are from families of that, of that size. And when I get it from that generation or older, I, it's, it's just hilariously ironic because they didn't have any technology. They didn't have any of the help that we have. They didn't have a lot of the things and they made it work just fine. So for that dynamic to be in play where they're kind of giving us grief about having four kids in this generation, I just think it's funny because it's, but it's just, it's different. I mean, certainly as I look around my friend group and neighbors and things and, it's rare to have more than two or three. So we're, we are, we somewhat are an outlier, even though that by a lot of standards four is not that many kids. And you described it getting easier and easier in a sense, the more kids you have. What though with Parker, for instance, what are the, uh, maybe, maybe the different challenges or just the amount of effort at, at some point, like what, what's the hardest time so far He's five years old What's the most difficult age so far where you, you feel like you need to give him more time than you did with the other kids at that age? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I, one joke that we often have is that we have, uh, well, so we have three girls and he's our one boy and girls can be kind of dramatic and whatever. And our oldest, uh, she can be a real drama queen sometimes. So we sometimes joke that we have a, we have Parker and then we have a special needs child, you know, just kind of making fun of how, how dramatic and maybe a little bit over the top they can be. Um, you know, he's just different. He's not much, he's not harder. I wouldn't say he's just, he's just different. So he, he gets to some of his milestones at a different time than the other kids. Like it took him a year longer to walk and he, he's five and he's still potty training. Our two year old is potty training or our not even two year old our one and a half year old is potty training with him right now. Um, some of those things are a little more difficult. But I wouldn't say they're harder. We just accepted that he's on a different timeline as as really the other kids are too. Um, if I look at, you know, when we get around um, our just turned four-year-old Isla, she's athletically very gifted. She she has a coordination level that's right on par with her sister who's twice as old as her older sister. So, you know, every kid is going to mature at their own pace. Um, one of the challenges I think probably more than anything with Parker is that we're just unsure of everything and we don't have, we don't have a good grip on timelines with him. You know, the other girls or the other kids kind of follow relatively close to what you would say is the standard timeline for a lot of their milestones. And he just doesn't, and, and he won't ever probably be on those same paces. So you just let him get to things as he gets to things. Um, you know, where we are, the resources and the support for uh, special needs kids is, is really good. I mean, we had in-home uh, services since the day he was born. So someone came to the house once a week and just kind of worked with him on lots of things. And sometimes it'd be a speech therapist. Sometimes it'd be a physical therapist, um, just helping him grow and making sure he's kind of making progress. And, you know, they don't really put out, you know, a, a specific time when things should happen. They just want to make sure he's moving forward. And then we nurture him as best we can. And, you know, I kind of just have always tried to just treat him like the other kids. And when he's needed a little extra help, we give him a little extra help. And I imagine that's going to continue to be the case as, you know, he gets further into school and, and, uh, but, you know, we put him in regular activities. We put him in just kind of day-to-day -day things that we do with the other kids. And if he, if he does well in them, great. If he doesn't, if he needs a little extra help, great. If he decides it's not for him that day, you know, he can not do it. So it's just another kid. It's kind of the way we've, that's it. That's the approach we've taken. Cause I think, and I'm not critical of people who do it the other way, but I think if you do it the other way where you just overly focus on the difference, I think you miss out on some stuff and you lose some focus on just the point of, of a lot of things that you do in life. And, and they're supposed to be fun and happy and positive and they shouldn't necessarily focus on the difference. They should just focus on what they are themselves. It sounds like your mind has shifted quite a bit from, you know, the moment you first knew that, he was going to be born to to now. Are there specific moments in your life since then where you you saw the light switch on a light flip on, for instance, on someone that you're talking to or someone that interacts with him that, that realizes whatever misconceptions that they had were indeed misconceptions and and that you're actually making a difference in in your crusading or activism, however you, you want to describe it? 
I mean, I would say yes. I, I, I think it's less now because we've been around people long enough that they just totally see him as a person and not as the label of Down syndrome. But early on, I think it was um, it was a lot more – you could see a lot more light bulbs going on with people. You, again, we kind of – particularly people who grew up in the 80s like we did. We use the R word a lot. We do a lot of um, – you know, we the kids who had conditions like Down syndrome were usually isolated and in special ed classes away from everybody else. That's not how this world works now. We're a little more sensitive to it. We know more. I think the education system is far better tuned in to how to make uh, people of all different, you know, uh, abilities um, be successful. So I don't think it's as – I don't think there was as much of a learning curve that needed to be had. But I think some of the little things – certainly the – Understanding about the physical limitations is probably something that most people didn't understand. I think most people look at it as mental retardation. They don't realize that it's actually a physical disorder in a lot of ways too. Um, so much so that and we don't use it, but technically speaking, we got a we have handicap parking pass and things like that because it's sometimes harder for kids with Down syndrome to walk and stay stay upright on slippery ice and things like that. Mm. Um, but you know, overwhelmingly. We took we took charge early and just really kind of put out here's where here's where we stand, here's our perspective on it, here's what we know, and this is how we want you to be. And, and by you, I mean everybody around us. We don't want you to feel bad for us. We don't want you to pity us. We don't want you to be shy about asking questions. We're still learning, but we're happy to tell you what we know. And it's really just in the spirit of making everybody accept everybody for who they are. And it's for me it's opened my eyes to all the different things that I was probably missing about everybody around me. I mean, for whatever reasons, I was pretty guarded or I was in a position where I thought I didn't need to be as accepting of certain people or I mean, I'm not, not in a bigoted way, just a, I never took the time maybe to really fully embrace the differences in people or understand the differences in people. And now I've, I've really understood that it's, there's beauty in all of it. So I'm, I'm really appreciative that I've had you know, these last five years with him in my life to kind of show me to take a little more time to stop and smell the flower, so to speak. I think it's very common, maybe the rural Minnesotan upbringing that, that I specifically had, you grew up in a slightly larger area, but not, not a big metropolitan area, that different is often looked at negatively. And it, it takes personal experiences with whatever you might deem as different to get your mind to shift and to change and realize different isn't a bad thing. It's just different. And maybe it's not even that different, really. It's just when you see someone that looks different for some reason, I think it's easy to look at that as a potential negative. And you know, clearly, this is another area. I and mean, I've talked a lot about maybe how we've shifted it, like racial ideas and concepts, getting to know different people from different parts of the world. And But one thing I haven't had a lot of experience with is interacting with people that have, for instance, Down syndrome, because I guess there's probably still, do you know, do you know the percentage of people that have it? There's not a lot of opportunities to come across someone. I no, suppose. it's, it's, I mean, in many ways it's rare. Um, and sadly it's getting rarer for some other reasons, but, uh, I'll get the number wrong. It's like one in 600 births or one in 700 births, something like that in, in the U S. So it's, I mean, it's not very, it's not very frequent in the grand scheme. So, I mean, count how many people, you know, in your life, it'd be unlikely that you'd know one. And in some cases, in some cases you, you might know a few, um, but it, it isn't very common grand scheme of things. It's, it's, it's a very common, um, genetic disorder. I hate that word, but whatever genetic abnormality, um, and it's survivable. Several aren't, there's lots of similar conditions that just would, would end up in, in miscarriage or would never, you know, create life. Um, this one is one that is survivable. So it, it's, it's amongst similar things. It's, it's the most common, but uh, grand scheme of things, it's not very common. So it would be unlikely that a lot of people would know a lot of people with it. Um, but, you know, we see uh, some kind of interesting, weird things that happen in the world. So the few other people that we've, we know that have children with Down syndrome um, kind of oddly fall into somewhat of an inner circle. Um, there's one family, uh, literally grew up in Michelle's neighborhood and the, one of the gal, uh, the, the mother of this child, uh, grew up just a few houses down from my wife. Um, so that's kind of crazy small world that you'd have two people in the same neighborhood. So just, you know, to do that. Um, I mentioned to you the other day that, uh, one of, 
one of my the other original Beatles, so first year Beatles, so before you were around, uh, had a son with Down syndrome, and and so it's it is it once you start looking around, you can start finding connections, but it is rare. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is, in the big picture, it's not it's not as common as a lot of other things, and it's it's it'd be weird that you'd know multiple people with it. You made a comment that I'm inferring that it's becoming more rare, and my my hunch is because the technology to find this out in advance is becoming better. People are opting to end the pregnancy at that point. That's that's the unfortunate. Uh, yeah, that's unfortunate to me. Um, and wherever you stand politically, I don't even see it as a political thing. I see it as an education thing. I think people are so grossly misinformed about how bad or sad or expensive or whatever it might be to have a kid like this, that they just rush to a bad judgment. And I also think institutionally, and we, we saw it firsthand, um, institutionally, when that result comes back, they don't have good resources to help you make what I believe is the positive decision or the right decision to take it through life. They were quick to tell us how we could get rid of it. And frankly, that kind of broke our hearts. And I've, you know, without without being as loud or boisterous on that side of it, when people are willing to have that conversation, I'm pretty passionate about trying to get people to, um, you know, choose life in that situation because I think it's really a poor, I think it's a poor decision to jump to conclusions and, and make a very misinformed decision. But you're also the clock is ticking to some degree in some of those cases too. So um, I would like to see the institutional side of things change where they're, where the initial response is more about how can we educate you? And if someone has to make a tough decision, they have to make a tough decision, but I'd like for that decision to be very well informed. And I, I, I can tell you firsthand experience. It's not the case. It's, it's the information is, lackluster to say the least or non-existent in most cases and i think the institutions need to do a better job and i've frankly tried very hard at the healthcare system up in st cloud to try to bring some of that change and a lot of red tape a lot of roadblocks just to make those kind of changes are tough unfortunately when i can with this podcast people I know show, I like to explain where I feel I was wrong in my life. And we'll get later to the being wrong segment where I, I put my, <laughs> every guest on the spot to come up with something that they can say they're wrong about. Because I, I find that the more people are willing to admit that they're wrong, the more other people that hear about this story might be able to look into their own lives and their own thinking and possibly reconsider something that they've been pretty, pretty convinced of. And I... I guess I can never know for sure, but I would say that prior to you becoming a father of Parker and being an advocate, I would have been one of those people that would have been first thought would be in the pregnancy if I if I was in that situation. But hearing about your story and just kind of seeing your interactions through Facebook and now having the conversation today and have another friend that's in a similar situation as you as uh, the parent of a, a, a child with down syndrome i can fairly confidently say that i've i've gone over to the other side and if i was presented with this this conversation with a doctor months before a, a baby would be born i i think i would now i i can consider my previous thoughts to be wrong and i i would be able to move forward with a better understanding of what really is going on instead of some preconceived notion about how much more difficult my life's going to be because of this that's frankly that's the goal i think for any of us who are on the side of of trying to bring more people with down syndrome into the world instead of end, ending it uh ending their opportunity i i really do think that it all stems from misinformation and and again i didn't have any of the information i i do i can proudly say i had a strong enough will um to go get it and not just jump to a conclusion or take the easy way out as i see it so you know overwhelmingly um, my anything I've ever done to try to push the information out there is to help people who may be put in this situation so that they can either have some of the information that I presented or they can know that it's out there that they can go find it because if they don't go looking for it, they're not going to find it. It's it's fairly well hidden and I believe some of that, again, is institutional. Um, I think that the healthcare system is trying to make it easy for us to try to whatever reason make these perfect people and it's never going to be the case. So I don't, I, I just think we got to, you know, we on the side of, of people with down syndrome need to keep showing how very similar they are or how the very much exactly the same they are. And then maybe 
help explain the differences and help show some of the beauty in the differences. And I think more people will will be able to get that information. The more people know, it's just going to spread. And I think that's kind of where I'm at is it's, it's got to almost be grassroots first. And um, to hear what you said is very good because I think that's that's the goal is to try to get people's mind. To, not necessarily, I, I, don't, I don't know that I can change people's minds, but I'd like to be able to at least give them the opportunity to um, take the information and make a decision with information versus making a decision without any information. I'm finding, at least describing myself, Good information, better information allows me to change my mind. I don't think you can change people's minds ever, but there are people that are willing to change their mind. And if you find one of those person and give them better information than they had before, then they can change their mind. So I, I would describe myself as extraordinarily open-minded. And certainly I think things and I, I feel like I'm convinced of some stuff. But you know, the more I live, the more I learn, I recognize that. I don't know as much as I think I know. I, I still try to learn, but I'm very aware that at any point, something that I think I know could be challenged. And I'm open to that challenge and kind of excited when I, I present with something new because I think learning and continuing to expand the mind in whatever way is possible is one of the most exciting parts of life. And to, to be stable in your thinking I don't, I, maybe I used to be that way. It's just not that much fun. Let's let's go learn some stuff and and create a life that we're not currently living that is better. And be more mindful of the things around you and the people around you that have experiences that are way different than yours that have something to share. There's a lot to that. I, I think one of the things that I've learned through this process and probably a little bit just in living life and being, you know, reaching the age I am is you just start understanding that you are are only allowed to live, you know, within what's in your vision, so to speak. And so you have to get out of that every once in a while. I mean, I know you travel and you get to see parts of the world. I haven't traveled beyond the United States much at all. So I envy people who've traveled the world, but there's so much even around you that if you just, you know, pivot just slightly to your left and start looking down this alley, you start seeing things you didn't see before. And, you know, I kind of, in growing up, I kind of always had this attitude that I always wanted to know how things work. So, I don't like to make knee-jerk reactions or make quick decisions. I like to understand them from a depth uh, beyond what's on the surface. So, you know, I used to love computers and I used to just get computers and take them apart so I understand how they work. Then I put them back together and then I might get different parts and see how I could, you know, boost speed or add capacity. All the tinkering. I like mm -hmm. to tinker. And I've done that same thing. I've gotten really into guitars in the last decade or so. Same thing with guitars. If I was in different mind, I might be under the hood of a car doing that same thing. But all in the spirit of how does this work? How can I make it better? How can I understand it more thoroughly? And that allows me to have a more meaningful conversation, a more meaningful relationship with people, you know, and just, I like the idea of open-mindedness, but I also, you also have to be absorbing things the right way or absorbing thing, being willing to actually take those things and retain them, not just here. You know, there's a lot of times where you can have a conversation with somebody and you can tell they're not listening. They're hearing you. They're just not absorbing it. They're not really embracing or appreciating what you're saying. Um, certainly in more recent years, I've been cognizant of when I'm not listening and why I need to like take more in for people so that I can have a deeper conversation or a deeper relationship with them and just learn more because you can, it's just fun to know things. It's fun to learn about people. It's fun to see life through somebody else's eyes and, and get a new perspective. And I think perspective is really important. So um, it's been fun. It's just been fun to me to learn uh, that skill a little bit, maybe too late in life for some things, but late in, you know, early enough that I can, I can live the rest of my life with a little better appreciation for a lot of things. As we sit here, I don't know what, if, what you think about or if you've thought about this empty note card. I don't come to this conversation with written notes. Sometimes I would. I, was, I thought I might. But what you said about like talking and listening, if I was prepared for all the things I was going to say next in a certain way, I, I would be listening to you less. I really do try to focus on just the things I'm curious about. I'm asking you questions mm -hmm. that I am curious about. And hopefully maybe people listening to us are equally as curious or at least somewhat curious about the things I'm asking you. I don't really know. This is pretty much just me trying to learn more in hopes that a curious mind elsewhere wants to know some of these things. But it definitely is a challenge to always be curious, I think, depending on who you're talking to and what they're talking about, and to stay in that present mindset 
of trying to listen. And like as I'm doing this, I, I do need to be aware that at some point we're going to finish this topic and we got to talk about other things. But I don't want that to be I don't want what we're going to talk about next to be more important than what we're talking about right now. Mm -hmm. And I do have a couple thoughts of what we are going to talk about next. Two other things, and we can tackle e either one of them first. You had mentioned in our correspondence before coming here today that you had some radio background. <laughs> that was one thing. And that's, I guess, the, the radio background is what allows me to have this pursuit of the podcast for, for, my, for myself. But the other thing, the reason that we came together is you were once an athlete and I was once a broadcaster. And that's how we cross paths. At what point did your passion for recognition of your athletic endeavors end and then you, you realize that was a, something you can move on from? Let's start. We'll start at the radio. We'll <laughs> okay. start at the broadcast one for, because it's the earliest part of the story. So when I was a, a little, little kid, my dad worked at WJON, uh, which is the Twins affiliate for much the north half of the state, I guess. Um, so I grew up around the radio station. And because of that too, I just always kind of liked radio and I liked sports radio and he, um, he didn't work there. Uh, he probably worked there till I was eight or 10 or something. Um, but that also gave us tremendous access to tickets and things like that, which was kind of cool growing up. I got to go to a lot of sporting events and they used to hold a host a show up there where twins would come up and I think in the off season and come up and do a, a radio show. So I got to meet a bunch of the twins during the off season, that kind of thing. So it was kind of cool. Um, that's my earliest ties to the radio business. But when I came back, when I graduated college, moved back home for a while, I took a little spell off. Uh, but then I started playing amateur baseball again. And then the noon to two uh, radio show on, on the fan 1390 up, up in St. Cloud, um, the host of that, he would have me and another guy in to talk town ball on Fridays for a half hour or something. Okay, um, And that turned into... Every once in a while, he'd call me in to just talk for longer. And then it turned into, uh, if the co-host was gone, could I come co-host? And so, I would do that on a fairly regular basis, you know, every week, every other week, a couple times a week. Uh, and then at one point, the co-host was, he'd left the show for quite a while. And while they were in the interim looking for somebody, I probably did that show three, four days a week. So, a couple hours on the air. Um so fairly regularly. And I, I was probably at, at its start to finish, I probably was on the air over the spell of eight or 10 years um, with some pretty heavy regularity in the middle there. Uh, and, um, you know, it sort of dwindled away. And then I, I was working downtown, so it was close enough to the radio station that I could get over there and just do the noon to two, which is kind of just a long lunch. Um, <laughs> a long then, lunch or did you even eat? Yeah, I would eat. I would eat during commercial okay, breaks. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, but... Then, uh, then when I took this job, it kind of, I, I, I'm, I'm out of town about 20 minutes. So it's a little different, uh, dynamic to try to get in, but I've come in a couple of times and then I've come in and uh, done, done a couple of things, um, just unrelated, um, on, on air stuff. So I loved it. It was just fun. It was never my gig. It was never my full-time job or anything like that. It was just kind of a fun side thing to do. And, um, it gave me cause to pay attention to some sports and, you know, I was kind of, I, I have a good kind of, uh, I think I'm a good, I don't like Minnesota teams. So to be on a Minnesota radio station talking about Minnesota sports, and I was always just devil's advocate saying, you know, this is a terrible deal for the twins or the Vikings are going to blow it next week, whatever. I know I was probably just the, uh, the dark, the dark side of all the, the warm fuzzies that you can make for better radio sometimes. Well, yeah, you gotta have, you gotta have a contrast, I guess. So that's how I ended up being a part of that for a long time. I, I imagine if I called up and said, I want to come sit in and do a day or two, I'd probably be welcomed back because I think it was fun. And I think I was, I was a, a good addition during the times that I was there. So, so that was that, um, as it relates to my sports career, I had a great time doing what I was doing all those years growing up. Um, you know, in, in the earliest, I just posted something on Instagram the other day, a picture of our high school team or our high school all-star game, actually. Um, and me and me and four other guys from the St. Cloud area were on the state all-star team. And we had growing up prior to that, we were all on a, a little a little league Babe Ruth team. That was we were like a national powerhouse. I mean, we won the state tournament every year. We went to the national tournament a couple of times. It was a great, uh, great 
great thing to grow up being a part of. It was just super fun and to win a lot was great and to have great friends and great teammates and great experiences was cool. You know, and then I had, I had a great high school career at Cathedral and the only thing that I didn't do there that would have been nice is we didn't, we didn't have great team success in that we never won a state tournament. We got to a couple. Um, but then my, shortly after my little brother won two of them. So he holds that over my head a little bit. Um, but you know, I, I went on to, uh, have a, a decent career at the university of Iowa in the big 10. And it was an awesome experience and wonderful. And I loved it and, um, some ups and downs on the field and off, but, you know, coming out of that, I had kind of realized that I was probably, um, the most fun I could possibly have had was playing those summers in Alexandria. It was just a blast getting to play with guys from all over the country, great schools, great competition, you know, living like, you know, living like minor league guys on the lowest level. So you're in terrible buses and terrible hotels eating scrappy crap. Food I, I and, think the, the food and the hotels and the buses all got a lot better. I guess I was around that league for about 10 years after you were gone. All that got better in most of the cities. But at that point, Ooh. it was it, rough. In it, those it, early it wasn't years. always that good. It was rough in those early years. And you, you always kind of relished when you'd get to go to the good cities that had you, cause you knew who had good food and who would put you in good hotels. But, uh, it was, there was a few sketchy, sketchy, t- terrible places. I, I won't sugarcoat it. There were dumps, terrible dumps that we'd stay at. <laughs> and there were times I still remember to this day uh, we played the longest game. I, I, I imagine it was the longest game in history. Cause I'm pretty sure they changed the rule on account of this game, but we were playing might've been, I don't know if you remember this, so I can't remember which year it was, but we were playing in Brainerd. So I don't remember if they even had a team the year you were there. They, they did. I remember broadcasting a game in Brainerd that went 17 innings, but I don't think it was your year. So go so on we, and tell we, the story. Well, we played a game that went till, I can't even remember how early in the morning. I remember I started it and I think I pitched seven or eight innings and it went like another at least 10 or something innings, but it, it ended in the early morning hours. And in those days, the food they, they gave you was either brought in or they'd let you eat the, re- the remains of the concession stand. Well, that food at the concession stand had been sitting there for three hours past its, you know, safe time to eat. <laughs> and so we got done after this marathon game. There's no food and everything was closed because it was so late at night. So there was like nothing to eat. I just remember that was the condition, you know, that was kind of comical, but that was like the conditions we had. We didn't, it was, we weren't real well taken care of in certain instances just based on, you know, obviously there's not a lot of money in those leagues and there's some things were still being kind of cultivated as far as sponsorship and, and things like that. So, um, just kind of a funny thing to look back on, but that was a blast. What a great, what a great fun way to, to be a kid playing baseball. Um, you know, and then after that I got engaged in college, I, I realized I wasn't destined to go on to the next level. I had a couple opportunities that I probably could have gone and, you know, been, been poorly paid at the lowest levels of pro ball. And that doesn't, didn't excite me in the least bit. So I kind of just made the decision that I had, I got what I needed to out of baseball at that time. You know, I got a scholarship to get a great education at a great school and I decided I'd just move home and get married. And I, I took a couple years that I didn't even pick up a baseball. I kind of had enough of it. A little burned out, little just sort of ready for the next phase of my life. And so I just kind of put it behind me. And then a couple of years later, um, my little brother finished up college and my cousin, uh, who's a, year, a couple of years younger than me, um, and we decided to start an amateur team in St. Cloud. So we started our own team there and I got back to playing and it was fun. And I took a different approach to it at that time where I'd, I'd kind of done what I I still look back at as pretty impressive things on my baseball career. So that was just strictly an opportunity to play for fun. I didn't need to play to win. I didn't need, I would try some different positions that I'd never really played. I didn't care if I was whatever. I just, it was fun and it was with friends and stuff. And, um, eventually I became the old guy on the young guy team that eventually became kind of the feeder program from cathedral high school. So it was a bunch of younger kids and I, I was enough older than them that we didn't, we didn't have a lot to associate to one another from a personal standpoint. So I eventually went back to the team that I played with in high school. Um, and we ended up winning a state tournament, God be 10 years ago now. Um, which was fun. I got to reconnect with some of my old high school friends and, um, made some new friends along the way and played for fun. And and then, then it was about the time we started having kids. And I realized that 
going to the ballpark for three, four hours a day, twice on the weekend and maybe on a Wednesday night wasn't something I really had time for or wanted to have time for. I really wanted to dedicate myself to being a good dad and being around my kids. And um, so for that reason, I've kind of stepped away completely from playing anything. I even I go golfing a handful of times a year for work outings, but I don't really even do anything like that. I um, Cause I don't want to, I really genuinely like just being around my family and being at home as much as I can, especially because I travel. So it's nice to be able to just kind of relax at your own house and just play with the kids in the backyard or whatever that might be. And now they're of, they're of an age where they're starting to get into sports and being on teams and stuff too. So I anticipate, you know, just following and cheering them on and, and being a fan. Do you think you'll be a coach at some point for one of them and try out that? Maybe um, <laughs> your reaction doesn't. I, it's funny. Doesn't I, I make me very think it's a yes. I'm very reluctant. Um, a couple of reasons, and it, the honest reason is I, uh, I was always on a team with the coach's son, and that has some nasty byproducts sometimes. And I, I don't really ever want my kid to be that kid, and I don't really want to be. I don't, I don't know if I. I think I'd probably be a good coach in some ways. I don't really have a lot of interest in it. Um, certainly at a highly competitive level. I think if it's just strictly going to be about fun and teaching kids how to play, I probably would. When I was in high school, I led the, like the T-ball stuff in, in one of the neighboring towns. And that was really fun. I just, it was like four to eight year olds all morning in the summers. And it was just showing them what it means to play the game and teaching them about it. So maybe at that level. So these, these years, I probably would be more open to it. Once it gets uber competitive, I don't really want, I don't really want that for my kids, to be honest with you. I think the generations have changed to now where it's just, it's over-scheduled, it's over-specialized. It's, I mean, every study supports that it's, we're in this terrible cycle right now where kids just are burning out too young and they're getting too much help too young. And frankly, I say this to a lot of people when they talk about that kind of thing, I go, yes, I worked hard, but I didn't, I wasn't the hardest working guy. I, I think you in many cases, you are probably just born to be better than some other people are born to be, um, you know, athletically gifted skills. And you can throw hundreds of thousands of dollars in specialty coaches and travel teams at some kids and they're never going to go. They're never going to get the scholarship. They're never going to get to the next level. Um, I can speak very candidly that I didn't work harder than a lot of the other guys. I just was gifted in ways that some people weren't. And I'm just giant man that some people aren't that gave me some physical advantages in certain things you too. Threw a little bit harder yeah. and the ball moved a little bit more. Yeah. I, I mean, it's just, you know, I did work hard. I work, I mean, and I did, but there were definitely people who were harder than me that didn't get anywhere, you know? So there more than anything, I guess the takeaway that I have is I want my kids to enjoy it and have fun. And there were periods of time where in my career where I wasn't having fun. And I, I look at that and go, okay, what was the reason as to why? And some of it was just the grind. It took, it stopped being a game and started being a job a little bit. And I think that's part of, um, that's part of where I just want to make sure my kids are doing things they actually want to do for the reasons that I believe are the right reasons. And that's really should just be for the social aspect, for the fun of it. If you're good enough that you're going to have an opportunity, I think you're going to have that opportunity regardless of if you're on the national travel team or if you just play the local Wednesday night league or whatever. And, um, you know, there's probably a happy medium in there that I think the kids will settle at. The other thing I might be excited to do is, is coach a sport that I didn't play. So my girls will probably play volleyball. Um, I did a few night volleyball league things over the years as an adult, but that's cool. My brother's a volleyball coach, uh, high school volleyball. My older brother's high school volleyball coach has been for a long time. Um, so that might be fun just to help get my kids into something that I didn't, I didn't do and, and learn a little something along the way. Let's move on to the personal growth segment with Corey Hollenhorst. And I wonder with the four kids at home, and the demands on your schedule, do you find time? What have you found time for for growing yourself and and becoming better in whatever ways that you think you're capable of being better? That's a good question. And I was thinking about this after we talked the other day, and I said to myself, well, what have I what has what has changed in my life since you knew me? And probably the two things that stand out to me more than anything from a personal growth standpoint, other than parenting, which we've talked a, a little bit about already, of course, um, I found I'm, I'm as outward as I put, position myself. I'm kind of an introvert. I like to be alone sometimes. I like me time. Um, 
I've gotten really immersed in music. So when I, I had an injury my senior year of college and I bought a guitar one day just singing, I, I'm going to have some time on my hands. I want, I've always wanted to play guitar. So I got, I got a guitar and kind of taught myself how to play. Um, and in years since then, I've kind of used that as a catalyst to just l- fall a little deeper in love with music. And, um, I'm, a, I'm, I, very candidly, I'm extremely obsessed with guitars. I have tons of them. I like to buy and sell and collect and fix and build and all that. And I've kind of, there's this really kind of neat community of people that are way into guitars like that, that I've kind of built some neat friendships all over the country really with that. So that's been kind of an interesting thing, but I guess that's more symbolic of just my desire to try to be creative um, and have an outlet because, you know, work can be pretty, pretty fundamental and work, work is work. Um, and I came from an industry that was very creative and I don't have as many creative outlets at my job anymore. So, um, I always want to have something where I can do that. And music's good because music, you can kind of sing and play anywhere. And my kids love it. It's a great opportunity to be together and do that kind of thing. And, you know, certainly Parker who has some speech delays and things, I think music's been really positive in his ability to talk, um, and understand and things like that as well as the other kids. I think our, my kids have all been early talkers and I, I credit music for that. So that's one thing. And then um, my lineage on, on kind of really on both sides is kind of hands-on. And I, I didn't grow up in a household with a lot of hands-on. Um, you know, my dad's an accountant and, um, you know, his dad was auto parts guy and grandpa was a welder. And on the other side, my family owns a painting company and they can do some carpentry and that kind of stuff. And um, so at some point, I don't even really know when, maybe 10 years ago, I just bought some saws and started figuring out how to woodwork. It's really? kind of teaching myself and um, it's kind of taken me places really. I, I, I really kind of credit the job I'm in as part of it because I work in the hardwood industry and is, I, I find some passion in what I'm selling and what I'm and what we're doing at our company. But, you know, I just started kind of figuring out the, the, there's a lot of math to it, there's some art to it, there's some science to it. And I've built a bunch of furniture. I've built, you know, I've done some construction, you know, built some rooms out and things like that. But you know, I've just, I've found that to be um, just an area where I can always kind of challenge myself to how to figure things out. And and then you have these kind of neat things that the fruits of your labor are cool and they can last a lifetime. I mean, I built this big dinner table a handful of years ago. That's going to be something that we hopefully take to whatever houses we move to and hands down to somebody and, you know, it's just something about being able to, you know, the act of creation is just kind of cool. And I've always kind of found time to have passion for stuff that I can, that has actual results, you know, physical or creative um, output. You just made some hand gestures here that, of course, no one else will have seen but me. <laughs> but I do see that you have all 10 of your fingers still, even with yeah. endeavoring into woodwork. That's something yeah. that... I don't know if it's a fear of mine, but I just, <laughs> I, I have a hunch that I, if I did that enough, I'd make a mistake you at some point. You just got to take your time. Okay. It's like anything else. Just be <laughs> prepared and know what you're getting into and you'll be fine. And it's, I don't know if you use the word, did you possibly use the word obsessed with the gu- gu- guitars? I did. That's absolutely obsessed. Okay. Yeah. So it's something I've realized very recently and it'll probably be a somewhat of a constant, at least in the, the near term on the podcast is... The people you're, you're describing people that are more naturally gifted and like you probably a baseball than some other people that worked really hard and all the money you spend, they're not going to be better than you. You were able to be. There is something to, to do with obsession, though. I'm realizing the people that are the best in the world at things, they are absolutely obsessed. Maybe not everybody with everything, but the people that are world famous for what they're doing. It's been a lifelong obsession. You get really good at something by spending an amount of time that seems almost incomprehensible at doing that thing. And I'm I'm curious about where my obsessions are and, and what I might become obsessed with at some point in life. But you, you talk about the guitars from the first time you picked up a guitar to now has this obsession, if you call it, made you a, a pretty good guitar player. You know, I'm OK. I, I'm there's people who pick it up and are who could pick it up and in a few weeks it'd probably be right where I'm at. I the, I think I have somewhat. I'm reluctant to take lessons and to learn from others. It's be, <laughs> I, part of my obsession is I want to be uh, 
is it autodidactic? Is that the word? Whatever it is where you're self-taught, where you do your own thing. Where it's you a can, word. I'm not sure if it's I think the right that's, one. It's we'll something like that. that. There's some word where it, it is that. I think I just heard it on another podcast even. I'm, re- I'm regurgitating. But in any case, I have a little bit of pride in going, yeah, I did that myself. You know, I didn't – no one helped me. You know, so as a stubborn German of me, I guess, that I won't – I haven't sought help and I've been a little reluctant to take it. Um, but I'm okay. I, I mean, I'm, I, I would say I'm, I'm very good but not great and I probably could get great if I just would let somebody help me a little bit. But I, again, I'm stubborn. Um, what I would say that I probably have reached expert level is actually the understanding of the actual materials that go into building one and the building technique and like the understanding of guitars. I probably know more about guitars than anybody I know. Because I'm just deep dive into the history of them. I've gone to conventions where I've learned all this crazy stuff. I've made friends with some of the bigger builders. I've gone on factory tours at the biggest guitar factories in the country. Um, and I've made friends with some really important people in that in that industry only because I want to know more. And I want to just immer- – I've I'm kind of an all or nothing person. So, I just fully immersed myself. Um Along the way, I've had a lot in my hands, so I learned to play them. And yeah, I, I do okay. But And I've been in a couple bands here and there, and I've played some friends' weddings and things like that. And my wife's trying to get me to join the band at church and get out and do more. So maybe I will. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, – I'm, no, I'm, no, I'm none of my heroes, and I'm nowhere close. It sounds like the obsessive part is more the understanding of how Absolutely. it works and not – the playing it. Absolutely. I would say that kind of relates back to even my playing career because when I was a baseball player, I had, I was obsessed with the sport. I was obsessed with my heroes in the sport. I was a huge Greg Maddox fan, um, you know, sort of local famously. I used to have all my bills and my caps. I had a quote from Greg Maddox written up underneath them. And I, I, I have every piece of paraphernalia from all the teams I ever played on somewhere in storage in my house. And every one of my game hats has these quotes in there. Um, I was a real student of the game. Now you're only as the student of the game thing will get you somewhere. Your natural skill will get you somewhere and your hard work will get you somewhere, but there's a ceiling to all of it. And again, I, I, I realized, and probably I think it speaks to my intelligence, maybe that I realized I wasn't going to get any further. And so thus I was okay walking away uh, when I did. But at the end of the day, I look back on everything I've ever done. It's always cause I don't want to probably somewhat, so I don't want to look stupid, but I just, Maybe I want to be the smartest guy in the room, but I always want to be able to talk intelligently about whatever I'm talking about. And it's usually about something I'm passionate about. So if I'm going to sit around with guitar people and talk guitars, I want to know everything about them. I don't want to look dumb and I, I kind of want to be the expert or I want to impress them. When I was a baseball player. I wanted to know all the stats and I wanted to know, you know, techniques and grips and all those things about pitching and, um, you know, woodworking, I'm learning more and I'm around a lot of people who woodwork. So I get, I'm picking up things and learning and, you know, once I know it, then I'll start talking more about it. But I, I'm a, I'm a pretty good observer. I'm a pretty good I'm a pretty good learner. Uh, I don't I didn't I wasn't a great student in school in the subjects that didn't matter to me. But the subjects that did, I was a very good student because I found passion there and I wanted to deep dive. I didn't want to do the homework in classes that I thought I'd never use, but on the things that I did, I was fully immersed and fully dedicated. I'm not sure how to create an obsession, or if that's even possible. I think just the brain draws us towards things in ways that we we can't control or understand, but the things that we become more obsessed with, we become very good at. But as I've been thinking about my own life, the things that I've been obsessed with, like I think kind of lately I've been obsessed with reaching goals for my Uber and Lyft driving. Like I set, I had my car almost a year and I had this goal to make a certain amount of money every week on average. And I'm going to come up just shy of that. But the fact that I've, come that close to it has been a very good financial thing for me because it's been an obsession to to make this happen. And I kind of stupid sometimes how little sleep I'll get some days because I feel like this is my opportunity to to reach that goal. But I, I think with obsessions that kind of you lose sleep, you do lose sleep with obsessions at, at certain points, I find because sure. that's you, you choose to do this obsessive thing or not. I, sometimes I don't even think that's a choice. You, you are obsessed in a, in a way that doing this whatever activity is is taking the place of sleep but i'm I'm hopeful for myself that as i i keep on moving along in my life i do find a, a new obsession somehow that that leads me to this the path that will i don't know set me free in, in ways that i haven't yet but i'm I, want, I guess having this topic i want anyone listening just to think about what they're obsessed about and if they're not obsessed about something 
uh, allow allow the mind to maybe draw them towards something that they might become obsessed with because I think being very 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 good at something is is probably pretty rewarding. It's it's even okay to not be very good at it. That's the thing. That's probably one of the most freeing things about getting you know my love of music is that I'm I'm not that good at it. My brother is a professional musician. He's got a recording studio and a band, and that's his gig. I'm not as good as him. I'm, and I probably never will be. He's got more education. He's got more experience, but I love it and I want to keep trying. So more than the obsession, it's the passion part. Mm -hmm. Like I could be obsessed about a lot of things, or you could take that obsessive nature and be an alcoholic or a drug addict or any number of bad things, vices. My vice is that I just love music and I love guitars and I want to keep getting better and I want to have another more new instruments and I want to try all these different things, but it all stems from passion. So more than being obsessed with something and trying to be the best at it, there's a lot of reward in just having passion and pursuing a passion. I see, I used to do a lot of portfolio reviews for students in graphic design programs. And I was more excited to see a bad portfolio for someone who absolutely loved what they were doing than a great portfolio for someone who didn't, who wasn't really trying that hard or wasn't that passionate about it. Because the level of satisfaction and excitement that that person who worked really hard and maybe the output wasn't as perfect or wasn't as beautiful or wasn't as successful, they still they still had the reward of feeling really great about their work. And the people who just kind of are blah about it, why bother? Even if you're great at it, why bother? Yeah, I suppose you're not always going to be great to the things you're obsessed about, but Probably you'll you'll get better. You'll see For the sure improvement. Get better, but you want because you want to, you know, because if you again, if you have passion, you're going to keep trying. I, I can I can think of things that I've tried and stopped. I can think of things that I never started in the first place because I didn't think I'd succeed or I didn't think I'd like it. Um, maybe I'm right. Maybe I'm wrong. But if you don't try, you don't know. So I'm glad I found some things that I tried and I took to, and then I decided to kind of go all in. And I think I've been good at some of them, and I'm keep getting better and. Um, but if you don't try or if you don't don't if you don't go on those urges, I mean, we all have some visceral uh, urges that push us toward things. You should try them. I mean, paint a picture, grab a, a pencil and draw a picture or go out and plant a garden or whatever the case may be. You don't know until you try and you'll try some things you don't like. And then you go, OK, well, at least I know I don't like it instead of just think I don't like it. And you you'd mentioned something to do with maybe what drugs or alcohol people can be you know it might be looked at as addictive but in some ways maybe it's obsessed with keeping up whatever patterns that that they've developed in that way and I'm fortunate that I haven't had much of that although recently I'll come clean I I had like an obsessive week gambling trying to gamble and trying to have <laughs> like this big realization that I could make a bunch of money gambling and I it didn't go well it didn't go terribly but it, it didn't go well and I'm, it allowed me to realize okay whatever obsession was maybe developing that week that's I can step back from this and put my time elsewhere and just just hope that the obsessions that I do eventually find are good for me and not something that's going to make my life possibly worse yeah I think it's hard for people to sometimes see what's not working until it's too too far down the road, but in certainly drugs and alcohol are one of those things. I think some people don't don't realize they have a problem because it was a slow, gradual process to get into. And, and gambling, I'm sure you see that on a regular basis. There's probably lots of people who come across your table that you probably don't know shouldn't be there. Um, but ultimately, I think it's one of one of many things in life where you just have to be able to kind of listen to what's happening around you, see what's happening around you and hopefully make good decisions. And that's, that, that can be true of any, um, anything you have an obsession about good or bad, you know, drugs and alcohol are probably not great obsessions, but you know, guitar can be a bad obsession if you're not spending time with your family or if you're not doing your work well or what, you know, anything. So it's, just, you got to find a balance in life just in general. Back now for the Being Wrong segment. Corey, we've had the conversation about a number of things so far, but now is the Being Wrong segment. So you get to explain to me and anyone that happens to watch or hear this something from your life that looking back now, you can definitely say that you were wrong about. Well, I, that's a great question because I have a long history of being wrong. I think the bigger than, bigger than one individual thing, I think it's just the idea that uh, I can accept that I can be wrong. And I, I for a long time, I've... Uh, 
probably would be best characterized by many of my even closest friends as kind of being an asshole about being right. Um, and in more recent years, I've been willing to accept that I am wrong and, and, and do have lots of flaws and, and, and probably can uh, improve in lots of ways. Um, one, one thing where I know I've been very wrong is I, I had a period of time probably coming out of college, most uh, notably, or coming out of high school rather, where I decided to just cut a bunch of people out of my life thinking I didn't need them and uh, that I could that I could go on without certain friends or without certain attachments to um, some things in my earlier days. And as I've gotten older, I realized that I that was a missed opportunity. I, sh I, I missed out on some friendships. I missed out on some opportunities to um, have some people in my life at important times. And and for that reason, I, I've been better in more recent years of just appreciating what's around me when it's around me and trying to maintain some relationships, even when they're tough, even when people are far away, even when people are, um, you know, immersed in their life as well. I am with mine. Um, but you need, you need a community, you need people around you. Uh, to that point, we just started going to church again, um, took a quite a bit of time off from that for a number of reasons that I've realized are probably wrong reasons, but you need a community, you need friends, you need people around, you need support and I'm, I'm more willing to accept that I did not, uh, that I did not know well enough to, to keep that as part of my life for a long time. Going back 15, 20 years, it was to cut people out of your life. I think it was different. The ways of being in touch were different back then. For sure. So as you move forward now with this realization, what are you doing to actively maybe keep people in your life, even if you don't always have a ton of time for it? Well, it's kind of funny because I thought, I think when I, I mean, I made some conscious efforts to like remove some people from my life and maybe to their benefit, me remove, be removed from theirs. But um, for a long time, I loved social media. It allowed me to have this sort of passive connection to lots of people. And I thought, for some reason that seemed to satisfy whatever I thought was meaningful to some relationships. But in more recent years, I realized that it just was a bigger disconnect. It kind of took us further apart. Um, so I've made a real, I, I completely got off of uh, Facebook. My Instagram still posts over there. So my grandma can see pictures, but I don't participate. Grandma's on the gram. Yeah. Well, she's on, she's on Facebook. So I guess my Instagram shows up on Facebook okay. so that certain people in my life can, can keep connected. But I made a real solid effort to stay off of that because it was, I needed to disengage, but it was also, it was so impersonal and it is so impersonal. Um, I've, I decided that more important than just having these sort of fake passive relationships with lots of people was to try to actually have meaningful face to face um, relationships with people have make a phone call, try to stop by and visit. I travel. One of the blessings of my job is I travel the country, but I get to go to places where some of my very favorite people live, um, who I haven't seen in a really long time. And I try to keep in touch with, you know, even if it's just a text or a phone call now and then you can still kind of be somewhat attached. But if you happen to be in the same place at the same time and you can make the ex extra effort to go out of the way just to see them in person and spend a little time with them, I think there's a lot of value in that. So, um, you know, I've just tried to, I've tried to be better at, at being actually present and connected. And I, I feel better about it. I don't know how successful I've been, but it feels better than it did when I was just like, you know, cool that I could see every little thing that's going on in people's life because of Facebook, but I didn't really have any meaningful relationship with them. Even if we used to be great friends, it still is, there's still a disconnect when you're solely going off of that. So it's, it's, it's really about connecting on a real level with people. One of the biggest realizations I've had from the People I Know show podcast that I created is, yes, I, I agree that you can kind of know what people are doing with their lives through social media, but this forces me, on average, once a week to get together with someone, some people that I'm very close with already, and an occasion like someone like you that I haven't seen in a long time, maybe never would have had another reason to see each other. I don't know I'm going to see you again, but I feel like doing this today we now share this. It yeah, allows us to be closer in some way. And this conversation gets to live on. And this is where the being wrong segment ends. And this conversation today with Corey Hollenhorst ends. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Good, good time. 
Thank you for listening to People I Know Show. Links are in the show notes for the People I Know Show Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube accounts. Please, when you visit any of those accounts to see photos with my guests and I or the occasional videos, subscribe or follow to stay in the loop. When I release an episode, I believe it carries an impactful purpose and am hopeful that it also entertains. If you appreciate my efforts, please take a few moments to help me make the show grow. If you have access to Apple Podcasts, which you will through an iPhone, go there and leave a rating and a review. That would be excellent. Equally as excellent would be to send the link of this episode to a person you know or share the link to all the people that you know on social media. And be sure to subscribe to People I Know Show on your favorite app to never miss an episode. A link for some of the places to listen is in the show notes. My new favorite app is called Overcast and is available on iPhone. Lastly, I crave your feedback. I'm always trying to get better. Reach out to me on any of the People I Know Show social media pages or to email your feedback directly to me, Kurt Carstensen. Use the email address, peopleiknowshow at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.